I'm here on purpose because I have a purpose. God is not finished with me yet. My best days are right in front of me, and I have victory in my life because Jesus lives in me. I say so much more. You know, this is a series that we're going to really close out the whole year with. We have eight weeks left in 2018, eight weeks left, and this year is going to be over. That's crazy. And I believe that God has so much more he wants to do in this church, through this church, in your life personally, through your life. There's so much more that God has in store for you and for me. God wants to do exceedingly abundantly above anything we ask, hope, dream, or imagine. The question is, do you want more? How many want more out of life? How many would like to see more happiness, more joy, more peace, more faith, more healing in your family, more love between you and your spouse? Somebody just say, yeah. <laughs> How many would like to lose some more weight? <laughs> How many like to get some more money? Come on, don't lie. You'd like to get some more money so you can have the, the, the funds you need to pay for the things that are in your heart. God has so much more. We serve a God of more. We don't serve a God of less. We don't serve a, uh, serve a God of decrease. We serve a God of more. He's a more kind of God. He's a so much more kind of God. When you look in the Bible, God never takes people through a, 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 a in this backwards movement. There's none of this. Like, it's not like God says, man, I, I just want my people to, to just go through the worst things and the worst things. Cause the end destination is going to be the worst thing that they've ever dreamed of. And, and at the end of their life, it's going to be the worst, worst, worst. God's a God that says, I want things to get better. I want people to get better. I want their life. I want the nation to get better. I want people's marriages to get better. I want people to experience more of my love and more of my power. I grew up in a house where we, we, we really did believe this. My parents, they taught me to believe that God is a God of more and that God wants to answer the dreams and the desires that are in our heart that are in accordance to his will. And that's important right there. And if you have a Bible, I want you to go to Mark eleven twenty two. 22. Yeah, we get loud and excited about the word of God. Ten of you got excited. <laughs> Mark eleven twenty two. 22. Jesus replying to the people said, have faith in God. Now, I love the amplified version. It says, have faith in God constantly. Look at that word constantly right there. Constantly. In other words, don't just have faith in God on Christmas Day, on Easter. Don't just have faith in God one time in your life at an altar call. Have faith in God constantly. It doesn't say have faith in your president. It doesn't say have faith in your government. It doesn't say have faith in your employer. It doesn't say have faith in your parents. Why? Because everyone and everything outside of God is shaky ground. At some point, the president that you love is going to let you down. <laughs> At some point, the president that you don't love is going to make you happy. At some point, the parents that have been everything for you, they're going to disappoint you. Your children, every, your employer, there's going to be people that let you down. But there is a God in heaven who will never let you down. He is good. He is good. So good. I love that song we sing. You're never going to let, you're never going to let me down. I love that because that's God's plan for our life. So it says, have faith in God constantly. And then it says in verse 23, truly, I tell you, whoever, everybody say whoever, whoever. Now, in other words, um, there's not like a big varsity God and a junior varsity God. There's not like, well, the adults get to believe God for big things, but the little kids don't. We serve a God who answers prayers of, of four-year-olds and answers prayers of 94-year-olds. We serve a God who says, hey, whether you got saved just now or you've been saved for 40 years, I can do a miracle in your life. We serve a God who does miracles even in atheist life. We serve a God who just surprises people who don't even deserve it because he says, whoever... Whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt at all in his heart, but believes that what he says will take place, it will be done for him. Whoever says, why do we say the confession? My best days are right in front of me because there's power in our words. You will have what you say. You will have what you say. You might, you might disagree with me and say, Paul, I can say whatever I want. Nothing's going to happen. Well, you can waste your time saying negative words. 
but I'm going to waste my time saying positive words because I've seen that as I declare my best days are right in front of me, I start walking in my best days yet. As I declare things that God's put in my heart, that these things are going to come to pass. We spend so much energy on the negative things and so little energy on the positive things that God has for us. And if you would use, it takes the same amount of energy to exercise faith as it does to exercise fear. It requires the same amount of energy to come up with fear filled words as it does to come up with faith filled words. Some people are just walking around going, man, you know, the world's going down. Things are getting worse. We got to buy guns. We got to bunker down. We got to be preppers. We got to live underground. Everything's going to be, you know, kapoosh and it's just going to be bad. And we got to, and, and they're, they're raising kids in fear. They're raising the next generation with this paranoid mindset, like bombs are going to fall on us any second. And I, I just don't want to raise my family that way. It takes the same amount of energy to raise a family with faith as it does to raise a family with fear. It takes the same amount of energy to live a life of faith as it does to live a life of fear and paranoia and panic. It takes the same amount of energy to believe God that you're the head and not the tail. You're the lender and not the borrower, that you're the overcomer and you're not defeated as it does to come over here and go, I'm just going to have to borrow from the bank every single time I need to buy something because I can't afford it. And God just wants me to suffer and live under and always be defeated. No, he doesn't. God wants so much more for your life. This building wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for people who believed that God has so much more for this city. God has so much more for 7700 South Lewis. The buildings across the street, Oral Roberts University, it would not exist today if that, that boy Oral, when he was 17 years old, having tuberculosis, wondering if he was going to live or die, wondering if God had a plan for his life, if he would have just said, I, I think God doesn't have much more for me. This is it. This is the end of the road. I'm going to die here. This is my last final chapter. But what did Oral do? He exercised his faith. God, if you'll save me, I'll give my life for you. I believe you have so much more to do in my life. There's a reason you're still here today. Some of you shouldn't even be here. You should have died in a car accident years ago. You should have died from that sickness, and yet you're still here. It's because God has so much more for you. He has so much more. Watch what the Amplified Version goes on to say in verse 24. For this reason, I am telling you, whatever you ask. Everybody say, whatever you ask. That means big or small. Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe, trust, and be confident that it is granted to you, and you will get it. Do you believe that God can do the impossible in your life? What kind of prayers are we praying? In Luke chapter 18, verse 8, it says, when Jesus returns, will he find faith on the earth? If he was to return in 1988, there could have been a lot of faith back then in the 80s. If he was to return in 1999, right before Y2K, there could have been a lot of faith in the late 90s. If he was to return in 2007, right when this worship center was built, there would have been a lot of faith happening in Tulsa. But what about right now in 2018? Where are the Oral Roberts of today? Where's the Lester Summerall's, the Billy Graham's, the Billy Joe's? Where are the Dr. Youngie Cho's? Where are uh, the Bensonita Hosas? Where, where are the guys? Where's the, where's the next Steve Jobs? Where's the guys that are dreaming of ideas? And I know that's a business, you know, not a Christian uh, person right there. But where's the guys? Where's the Wright brothers of 2018? Where's the people that are going, I wonder what hasn't been invented yet? Where's the Thomas Edison's and the George Washington Carvers of today? Where's the Joshua's who wanted to take Jericho of today? Where's the Moses's that wanted to deliver a million Jews out of Egypt? Where are those people today that are exercising their faith saying, maybe God has more for my life than just to make some money, just to have a nice little life, just to sit in the pews, just to sing songs. I wonder if God has more that he wants to do in me and through me. In Luke 18, that same chapter in verse 41, Jesus encountered a blind man that was crying out and he was saying, son of David, son of David, have mercy on me. And, and so Jesus comes up to him and says, what do you want? What do you want me to do for you? That was the question. What do you want me to do for you? My question for you today is what do you want God to do for you? Not that he's a genie in a bottle because he's not going to give you whatever you want. And he's not going to give you however you want it, whenever you want it. But God is the kind of God that says, bring to me your prayers and requests and watch what I can do. Right. God wants us to believe that there's more for our life. I think some of us are asking too small of things for God. 
In 2 Kings chapter 2, Elijah was getting ready to be taken. There was only two men in the Bible that didn't die. They were taken up to heaven. One was Enoch. The other one was Elijah. They were taken up in, in, in like a chariot of fire. Angels take them up to heaven. God had an assignment for them. Well, on the day that Elijah was about to be taken, there was this young man named Elisha that was a mentee of Elijah. He was following Elisha. They're walking together. Elijah in chapter 2 says, you can leave here. Because I'm about to go, so just stay right there. I'm leaving. But the guy wouldn't leave him. Daniel, will you just step up here? I want you to, I want you to see a visual of this. So, so Elijah's trying to tell Elisha, hey, just stop. Stop right there. I, I got to go. But Elisha just kept following. Hey, just, just stop. I've got to go. But Elisha just kept following. And Elijah said, hey, listen, you can stop. This literally happens five times in Scripture. Elijah says, just, just stop. Like, I've got to go. You got to stay. What? Elisha was like a shadow. He would not stop following Elijah. Why did he keep on following Elijah? Because he wanted more for his life. He knew there was a blessing connected to Elijah. He knew that as Elijah left, there was a mantle that was going to fall, that, 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 that Elijah was leaving, but the legacy was staying. He wanted to carry on the legacy. He wanted the baton. He wanted more for his life. Elisha was grown up in a business home. He, he understood the idea of multiplication, stewardship. He knew that Elijah had done some great things, but there was more that God wanted to do through the ministry of Elijah, and he was looking for someone else to carry it on. So Elijah kept telling him to stay. Finally, Elijah turns around and he says this in verse um, uh, 9 of 2 Kings chapter 2. Throw the scripture over there. Finally, Elijah turns and says, what can I do for you? <laughs> What can I do for you before I'm taken away? What is it that you want? And Elisha asked him a bold, audacious question. He said, I want double portion. I want double. I want double the impact, double the power, double the, I want double. I want a double portion of the mantle that was on you, Elijah. Now, Elijah could have gotten threatened. He could have gotten upset punched him in the face. How dare you ask to do more than I did? But he wasn't that kind of person. Elijah said back to him in verse 10, you have asked a hard thing. You've asked a hard thing. Are you asking God for the hard things? Or are you asking God for things you could do in your own strength? This morning, I was praying over this message, and God knows that I've been asking him for some things that I'm believing for personally and for our church. And God said, Paul, stop asking me for stuff that you can do. Because I was like, I was asking God, I was like, God, you know, I would love to just continue to grow uh, and reach our city as a church. I'd love to see all of our services continue to grow and reach all the people back here in the apartment complexes. I'd love to see, you know, more people who are unchurched, who aren't right with God coming in. I'd love to see like, you know, at least two, three, four hundred more people come into our 9 a.m. service. And God said, stop asking me for hundreds. Start asking me for thousands. I was like, God, what? <laughs> He said, you could do, you could, you could reach a hundred. You can reach 200, 300. You, you know, go door to door, put out the flyers, but thousands would be a God thing. Imagine, imagine whatever it is you've been asking God for and triple it. And you might go, no, 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 Paul, we're not supposed to live in excess. We're not supposed to have more than enough. We're literally just supposed to survive and barely make it into heaven and just, you know, have just a little bit to tip the waitress 5%. You know, we don't want to bless her too much. We don't want to give her like 20% uh, at the restaurant, you know, and we just, we don't want to give our kids too much when we die. We just want to barely give them some. No, God wants you to have more than enough so that every time you go eat, you bless that waitress. You give that waiter a tip so that you give your kids a legacy to carry on for your children's children. children. You are an heir of Abraham. You have the same promises. He said, you've asked a difficult thing. Nevertheless, if you see me, look at verse 10. Elijah said, nevertheless, you've asked for a difficult thing. But if you see me, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be. If you see, it will be. If you see it, you can be it. If you see it in here, you can do it out there. It starts in the mind. Give Daniel a big hand. If you see it on the inside, it can happen on the outside. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. You know what faith is? 
Faith is believing that the current is not permanent. Faith is believing that the current is not permanent. I've got a picture with me this weekend that I found in my dad's office, and it's from 30 plus years ago. And if you look closely at this picture, you see the Maybe Center. This is 7700 South Lewis. This is the street we're on right now. Here's the Maybe Center. Here's the dormitories, the prayer tower. There's the Arkansas River, cow pastures, cow pastures, cow pastures, cow pastures. Where's the Marriott Hotel? Cow pastures. Where's Starbucks? Cow pastures. Where's McDonald's? Cow pastures. Imagine if the person who took this picture and the people who were here during this time said, boy, that's a good picture. That's as good as it gets. Man, what an awesome city we have. This is it. This is the final product. God is so happy with what we've done with Tulsa. Doesn't get better than that. That's it. No more. Don't expect to see anything. No more development. You know, God's not into development. You know, just be content. That's all, there, that's all there is to see. Imagine if they settled for the picture in that season and said, this is permanent. We serve a God who never says the picture is permanent in your marriage, in your family, in your finances, in your job, in your business, in your church, in your ministry, in your dreams. He doesn't say, hey, get comfortable with that picture because that's as good as it gets. He says, I want you to believe me for more. Imagine if, if my dad would have driven by here and said, that's a good piece of property, but that's reserved for the cows. And we, you know, we're supposed to just make sure the cows have enough pasture and we're not going to try to invade their territory. He looked over there and said, that's a good spot for a church. That's a good spot to reach this part of Tulsa. That's a good spot to start a hub that changes the world. Let's, let's build a church right there. Let's build a Christian school, kindergarten through 12th grade. Let's buy some more acres over here in case we move from a 1A school to a 2A school to a 3A school. Let's get four more acres in 2018 in case God wants us to be a 6A school someday and really reach thousands of boys and girls with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hey, you know what? Let's build a youth building over here and let's put a missions training center and build some Bible college housing so we can train up tomorrow's youth pastors and church leaders and missionaries that invade Cambodia and invade Burma and invade Africa and invade Europe and Russia and St. Petersburg. Let's not just get comfortable with the current picture because God has so much more. God has more for you. He has more for you. This is what Elisha realized. Elijah, you did some great miracles. You called fire down from heaven. You got rid of all the false prophets. You turned the rain off and you turned it back on. You were fed by ravens. You were taken care of in, in, in crazy ways. You multiplied for the widow. You did great things. But Elisha said, I think God has more. I think God has more. When my father passed away, I was discouraged. I was defeated. I remember driving up to this church building, just overwhelmed, feeling like the best days were behind us. In fact, I was saying that out of my mouth. The best days are behind us. I was discouraged. I was defeated. I was overwhelmed with a sense of defeat. And I heard God say, change the narrative, change the narrative. And I found a napkin in my car and a pen. And God said, write this down. And with tears in my eyes, I started writing down on this napkin words that I didn't believe yet, but words I wanted to see happen. I was changing the picture. And I wrote down, I'm here on purpose because I have a purpose. I didn't feel that way because I felt like my purpose was lost. You never realize how much uh, your purpose is connected to a person until that person's taken from you. Anyone who's, who's, who's lost a family member that was really close in their life, your spouse, you never realize, or your dad or mom, you never realize how much your life was connected to serving that person, and that's where you found your purpose, and then that person's gone, and you're like, what, what, what do I do? I'm here on purpose because I have a purpose. My heart is open. My mind is ready to receive. Because God is not finished with me. I stopped right there because I thought, no, I don't know. I just feel like he is. I feel like he's finished with the Doherty's. I feel like he's done. Some of you feel this way right now. You've settled for the current picture. You've said, this is it. He's done. There's no, there's no more to do here. He's done developing me. He's done developing us. 
There's no more for our business. This is as good as it gets. God wants to raise your thinking. He wants to break the, the ceiling that you've put over your life. He's wanting, it's a glass ceiling. He's giving you a hammer. He's saying, just go ahead and break that ceiling. I got so much more for you. If you're single and you want to get married, God says, I got the right spouse for you. It's going to be the most amazing marriage. The picture is not finished. Don't get comfortable with your current picture. If you're barren right now, don't think that God doesn't have a plan for your children one day. God shows up to Abraham and Sarah and says, I know you're in your late 90s, but I got children for you. I'm going to, oh, count the stars if you can, Abraham. I'm going to make you the father of many nations. You're going to have so many kids. You, your kids will outnumber the stars in the sky. And you know what Abraham said? He just had a vision for one. And God, if you just give me one kid, God's like, one? I'm going to give you like a billion kids. <laughs> I, I, your ki one? It's like me saying, God, just grow our 9 a.m. service just a little bit. God says, stop asking me for the smallest. I'm about to blow your mind. I'm an Ephesians 3.20, exceedingly, abundantly, above anything you hope, ask, dream, or imagine. Stop limiting the unlimited God. Stop limiting the limitless power of Jesus Christ. We don't serve a, a Savior that stayed in the tomb. He rose from the dead. Stop believing that your prodigal son is going to be prodigal the rest of his life. He's coming back home. So he shows up to Abraham and Sarah and says, the picture's not permanent. You're going to have kids. Abraham and Sarah get frustrated because it's not happening on their timeline. And so Sarah says, Abraham, this is in the Bible. In case you're wondering what story this is. <laughs> Sarah, the wife of Abraham, who's in his 90s, she's in her 90s. She says, Abraham, it's not happening. Go sleep with my maid, Hagar. Abraham says, I'm a team player. I'll do it. So he goes... <laughs> does what she says. It's in the Bible. Don't judge me. It's in the Bible. Abraham does it. They end up having a, a child outside of God's will named Ishmael. The rest of their life, there's just rebellion on that side of the family, just rebellion. Sometimes we get frustrated with our current picture and we try to take matters into our own hands. We try to just do it our way. If we will just trust God and believe in God and wait on God and recognize that God's plan, God's way, God's time is so much better than our time, our plan, our way. I'm thankful God didn't answer some of my prayers as a teenager. I'll join Garth Brooks. Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. There were, thing, there were jobs that I wanted in high school and college. I'm so glad God didn't make it happen that way. But what I've realized is that God wants me to bring every desire to him and then let him determine the desires that are from his heart that are best for my life. God wants me to bring every small. And listen, you might think things are outside of like, well, I don't know if God cares about that. I remember when I was six years old and I was learning to exercise my faith. And we were on our way out to Camp Victory, out to Manford, Oklahoma. We were in my mom's big blue van and we're driving out there and my dad turns around in the van and says, okay, each of you kids pray a prayer today. So Sarah prays her prayer. Ruthie prays her prayer. My brother John prays his prayer. Then it gets to me. And I said, Lord, I pray that you will help me catch a lizard today. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> My dad laughed. He was like, I don't know if that's God's will. I was like, dad, it's not unbiblical. <laughs> I may not have used that big of a word. I was like, dad... God's not against it. He created lizards. And uh, I was like reasoning with my dad in the van. He's like, okay, all right, well, we'll see what happens. Don't, you know, God's still real, even if you don't catch a lizard. I know, but I believe I'm going to catch a lizard. So we get out to Camp Victory and uh, we're walking around. My parents, this was before we had any closed in buildings. There was just pavilions out there, open air pavilions. So my parents were doing a prayer meeting underneath one of the pavilions, worshiping, praying, uh, hundreds of people out there. And I was with all the kids and teenagers. We were near the forest over there. And sure enough, I saw this lizard and he was changing colors. He was turning blue and green right here in Oklahoma. Who would have thought we got these kind of lizards? And I knew God put that lizard right there for me. So I went walking over there and I put my hand down and he was whistling through the leaves, wiggling around. And I pulled my hand up and I caught the lizard. And I was so excited. I was like, you're real, God. I knew you were. <laughs> but I was so, my faith was growing. My faith was growing. 
And I couldn't wait to go show my mom and dad. So I go running, you know, back to the pavilion. I'm shouting, dad, God's real. Faith works. Faith works. You know, and they're in the middle of their prayer meeting. My mom's praying for this woman. Mommy, 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 mom, pulling her dress and she won't listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Now I see where my kids get it. Mommy, mommy, mommy. She won't listen. She's praying. So finally, I just put my lizard on her and it starts crawling up her leg. <laughs> no joke. I kid you not. Daniel Grothy was next to me, my brother John, and this lizard crawled up. My mom goes, oh, hey, hey. And the woman thought the Holy Spirit was coming on. So the woman starts going, hey, 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 you know, and they're shouting and screaming. <laughs> It was like an exorcism was going on. <laughs> I mean, it was so funny. My mom was like, what is happening? I said, mom, faith works. I caught the lizard. <laughs> but the lizard was just the beginning for me. As I got older, I started exercising my faith for things. And listen, this is not about like, you know, God, some genie in a bottle. You ask him for stuff. He gives it. That's not how he works. But what God wants to see is he wants to see us operate and stretch our faith to believe for more so that we can be a blessing in other people's lives. The lizard is a funny story. But as I got older, I started believing God for things that I could use to be a blessing for other people. I remember when I was 12 and I heard this, you know, announcement that our church was taking a missions trip to Juarez, Mexico, and it was going to be $500 to go. And I, I didn't want to borrow money from my parents. I didn't want to ask them to pay for it all. And so I went out and I started working, but I started praying. I wrote it down on prayer, offering envelopes. I said, Lord, I'm believing God that I could get the money to go to Juarez. And I remember all the money came in. And then I remember when I turned 16 and I really wanted an SUV. I wanted a car, but I didn't want just any car. I wanted an SUV. And I really liked Broncos. I loved like Explorer, Ford Explorers, Broncos, just, you know, something. And I wanted lightning stripes on the side. Like I had this, I had this dream. I know you think I'm ridiculous, but I had this dream. I thought, you know, I would love to drive a Ford Explorer with lightning stripes on the side. And I had been mowing lawns with my brother, John and AJ and, and God started blessing us with more lawns and more opportunities. And I started writing down in my journal and on my prayer envelopes, every time I would give, whether it was $5 or $10, I'd say, Lord, I believe that I'm going to have a vehicle and that it's not going to be just some vehicle that barely gets by, but it's going to be a Ford Explorer. And I was looking through Auto Trader, the magazine that was in the newspaper, and I came across a 1993 Ford Explorer with lightning stripes. And I remember walking into the store that day. And I paid cash, $4,000 as a 16 year old, didn't have to borrow any money from my parents, money that I had worked for, money that God had blessed me with. And I bought that car. I didn't know a penny on that car after that day. And I drove that car around like it was like the nicest car in the world. I, I gave people rides, but it was a blessing that I was able to, to pay for that and not have to keep on paying it off year after year. And I think sometimes in our lives, we settle for a lifestyle that I don't believe that God's called us to live in our whole life. We think, you know, God just wants churches just to borrow from banks the rest of their life and, and always be in debt. And God wants Christians just to barely get by and, and constantly be the borrower and never be the lender. And God wants us just to suffer all through our life and never have enough money to help fund future missionary work or ministries. And, and I just truly believe God wants people to prosper. God wants you like when you read Ephesians 3:20. It says now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above anything we ask, hope, dream, or imagine. I remember when I went to Oral Roberts University as a student and I was 18, 19 years old and some of my classmates, they started really bashing this, this idea that God wants you to prosper. I mean, they were just so against it. They said, that's wrong. God wants us to be poor. He wants us to be poor, poor, poor. You're not supposed to prosper. Christians shouldn't, you know, have a nice car. Christians shouldn't own their own house. And it was like this intense, it felt almost like a demonic attack. Um, that was coming from like Christian friends. And honestly, I started to listen. I started to believe a little bit and I stopped stretching my faith and I stopped believing for more. And then I, as I was sitting in our church services here at victory, and every time I'd walk through the doors of victory, I just kept hearing God say, I've called you to live in victory. I've not called you to be a victim. I've called you to be a victor. 
I've called you to walk in victory, live in victory, not just spiritually, but financially, academically, relationally. I don't believe when you read the scriptures, God didn't say to Abraham, Abraham, I want you to be the most poor man in the world. And I want you to pass on poverty to your children and your children's children so that all the future generations will be poor through you. That's not the Bible. The Bible says, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. And in blessing you, I'm going to cause your children to prosper and your children's children. And you will be a blessing to the nations of the earth. Do you see the Bible I read doesn't say that we're called to constantly live defeated, discouraging, uh, victim mentality lives. So all of a sudden I started exercising my faith in the midst of all of that criticism, cynicism against this message. I started exercising my faith. I started asking asking God, Lord, would you give me extra opportunities to give? Because I truly believe it's the motive. It's the heart behind prosperity. That's where it really lies. If you want to prosper just for yourself, you're missing out on the real reason that God's called you to prosper. The happiest people are the most generous people. The happiest people aren't the richest people. The happiest people are the most generous. It's the people who have the mentality and the attitude in the heart that I'm blessed to be a blessing to the nations of the earth. So I started asking God for opportunities. I started mowing more lawns, working as a summer fund counselor, started working as a janitor at ORU. And then I started getting into real estate. I didn't have a real estate license. I think it was illegal. I didn't know it was illegal until after I got out of the job, but I was doing it for two years. I started flipping houses with guys and you know, we started painting and, and fixing up stuff. And I remember when I was 19 and a half years old, my dad got up on this stage, not this stage, at the Maybe Center. This wasn't built yet. This didn't exist. And he said, we're building a church auditorium. We're building a children's area. And we're asking you to sow today directly into the kids area. Now, I didn't have any kids, but I heard God say, I want you to give a big sacrificial seed. And I remember hearing God speak a number to me. And it was all that I had in my savings. I had been saving up from flipping houses, from doing stuff. And God said, trust me in this. Watch what I'll do. Proverbs eleven twenty four says the world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. So I heard God say, trust me in this. So I gave, and it was one of the greatest feelings as a 19 and a half year old, because very few other college students were able to give like I gave that day. I gave $7,000. I got a call that week from my grand grand because she worked in the accounting and she said, Paul, I see an offering envelope. Are you sure that you have this money? Is this going to bounce? This is a check. Is this going to, is this really going to, are you sure you were supposed to do this? I said, grand grand, God, God spoke to me. I was supposed to. So she goes, you're one of the biggest givers in the church. How cool was it to be a 19 year old and be one of the biggest givers in the church? I believe there's some 19 year old millionaires that are sitting out here in this room that God's called you to be the biggest givers in your family, the biggest givers in this community, that you could eradicate poverty in this city. Come on. We are not called to just survive as a church, as Christians, to make zero impact on the economy of our city, on the economy of our nation. We're not just here to make a spiritual impact. We're here to make an impact on every part of society. This is why we get involved with the arts because we don't want to just impact inside the church. We want to impact culture. We want to impact what's happening out there. And I remember sowing that seed within a year. God had more than tripled what I had given that day. As a 20 year old, I was able to, uh, when Ashley and I got married, I was able to pay for everything with cash that we started out with from just jobs, odd jobs and opportunities and random stuff that was totally disconnected from the church that God had blessed. Me. I believe God wants to bless you so much, so much more than you realize. Oftentimes we're waiting on God to do all the work for us. James chapter two says faith without works is dead. Oftentimes I, I love watching football. How many of y'all watched the OU football game last night? Come on. That was a close one, but we got it. We got it. Right. And, uh, I, I, I was watching how the quarterback, he threw a couple interceptions there in the beginning, but the quarterback and the receivers, they have to be in sync. The receiver has to know what the route is. 
And then he has to follow through with the route. If he doesn't follow through, the quarterback could throw a ball to a place where he's supposed to be. And if he's not there, then it goes to nobody. It's just sitting out there. And oftentimes God's speaking to us. He's saying, listen, I've got everything you need and I have the routes for you to run, but you got to get off the line of scrimmage or else you're going to miss out on the provision that I've got lined up for you. Let me explain it to you just for a second. So Josh, Josh works in our youth ministry, does a great job. Don't take the ball from me. <laughs> uh, but Josh, what I want you to do is we didn't practice this. So this could go south really bad. We'll have to edit it out on TV, but this is what you get for a live experience right here at church. Um, I want you to line up over there. Now, the receiver knows when the quarterback says, down, set, hut, he's supposed to do his route. If he stays where he's at and he doesn't do his route, what happens is the ball goes, uh-oh, someone catch it back there. Don't get hurt. Come on. I was the third string quarterback for our school. I started when guys got injured. Come on. <laughs> Not that I was praying that they would get injured, but all right, here you go. Come on, somebody. But um, I think oftentimes God's saying, come on, the provisions waiting for you. The promises are waiting for you. But oftentimes we're expecting God to just run the ball to the end zone for us. Like, God, you score all my touchdowns. You make it happen. Grow my business. Make my marriage better. Lord, fix what's going on between me and my kids. And God's saying, well, get off the couch and stop binging on Netflix. Get off the line of scrimmage. Lord, I pray that you just solve the problems in my marriage, and yet we won't even make a move. And God's saying, I've got all the healing for your marriage, but you got to get off the couch. I, hey, uh, Lord, I just wish that you would just fix my, you know, what's wrong with my prodigal son, but I'm not going to call him. He's got to call me and apologize because I don't want to humble myself. God's saying, get off the line of scrimmage. I've got it all lined up. Lord, I wish that you'd multiply my business. Lord, make my, I want to be debt free. And yet we continue to rack up all the credit card. God said, if you would just run the route, I've got the provision. Are you ready, Josh? You ready? All right, here we go. Down, set, hut. Here we go. Here we go. Let's see what happens. Uh-oh. Oh. <laughs> Tipped off the side. He gets the provision. Come on. If you will run your route, God's got everything you need lined up for you. God's got the provision. He's got the direction. He's got the promises. And oftentimes, we're waiting for him to move, and God's saying, I'm waiting for you to move. I'm waiting for you to move. How do we move? I believe the promises of God are motion activated. When you move, some of us are standing in front of a closed door. We're like 15 feet out, and God says, if you would just take five steps more, those doors are going to open. Th those doors are motion activated doors. They will not open up until you get right in front. But as you start moving, the provision's coming the opportunity. I have so much more. God has so much more for you. So much more. A few years ago, God dropped it in my heart that one day we would move our Bible college on this side of the street. One day we'd move our youth group on this side of the street. I started seeing this idea of a building. Daniel, will you pass me that paper over there? Little did I know, I didn't even know this, but I was in my dad's office and I found blueprints that were never completed. And he... Long story short, I submitted this dream to God. I said, God, if you want us to have all that over here, then you're going to make it happen. Well, just in the last year, God accelerated the dream and um, a generous uh, donor connected with Oral Roberts University reached out to us and said, what do you think about um, us buying the 81st in Delaware Victory Bible College building for a pretty good, amazing offer? 
that was appraised at that offer. It was appraised at that offer, which we were amazed that it was appraised at that offer. And they said, and with that, that would give you, because these people, they knew that God had been stirring in my heart a vision, a dream, that through this, ORU would get what they need because they're, they're believing God for increased growth. God's growing ORU amazingly right now. They're like in their best days ever as a university. They're just continuing to grow. And so I shared it with the board, the offer, and the board said, let's do it with that. That allows us to get started on the dreams that these blueprints have been laid out for years and years and years. We're getting ready to expand as a church, our Bible college, our youth, our uh, children's church, our school of worship, our school of media, school of creative arts. In fact, I want uh, Chris, who leads our sound and oversees all of our AV, Chris Trowbridge and Chrissy, they have an awesome testimony of seeing God prosper their finances um, because they got involved in their giving. Give them a big hand real quick. Sure. Well, last, um, the summer of last year, the Lord put it on our heart for our daughter to go to Victory Christian School in, as a K-5 uh, student. And at that time, you know, we're single income home. We have three little ones that I'm running around chasing. And um, it was an awesome Thing that we wanted to do and we felt the Lord say to do it but we're like okay how do, how do we do this and so we had enough money to put her in but not enough to get her all the way through so about midway through the year we had enough to pay for one more payment of toward her tuition and so we're like okay we're gonna pay this and you know I'm not sure what's gonna happen I just felt the Lord stir me and, and say would I call you to put her in there and not finish her tuition would I would I call you to put her in and then have you take her out and so I felt in my heart to sow that money um, that, he, that would be for her tuition. And the payment was due in about a week time. And so it was a week, we had a week deadline. And so I'm like, okay, Lord, if this is you, you're gonna speak to my husband, he'll have the same thing. And sure enough, he walks in the door and he said, hey, the Lord told me we need to sow that seed into the church um, and he, he'll take care of us. And so I'm like, okay. And you know, we, we've been tithers, but giving over and above, it's been out of convenience versus out of faith and you know convenience doesn't move the heart of God but faith does and so this was a, a faith move for us to, to sow this uh, seed that could be another month of her school so anyway within that same week we get a check for three times the amount that we sowed into the church with a note and this person knew nothing of what was going on and the note said I know the plans I have for Ariella to give her a future and a hope and it's, this is for her tuition. And we didn't tell anybody what was going on. And so it just showed us God sees us. And it was a challenge of we need to exercise those faith muscles, not just praying things to happen and praying things in, but putting seed in the ground for things to grow because zero times nothing is zero, but God will multiply what you put in the ground. So, so he paid for that, um, that whole last year of last, sorry, her uh, kindergarten year. So she, the start of this year, she'd be in first grade. Again, Lord, we don't know how we're gonna do this, but we have the desire to put her in. And um, he told us to put her in, and about the week right before school started, we get a check to cover her whole entire year of tuition at Victory Christian School. So she's in, and now it's in our hearts to be able to do that for another student or many other students, and, and even to give to this um, vision for the, the kids. It's so exciting to be able to see when God meets it. It's like, it's addicting. You're like, I'm going to do it again because God, you're going to meet over and above. I just took all the time, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, really the, the baton has been passed. I feel like from one generation to the next where we have uh, ridden on the stories of faith of those who've gone before us. We stand, you know, we're in the buildings and we, we see all of these stories and we hear these incredible things. And I believe God is raising up this generation and challenging us to give boldly, to give extravagantly uh, from a place of, uh, even if it hurts, you know, God uh, will bless you. Uh, his prosperity uh, and wealth, kingdom wealth will come upon you. And I just, uh, yeah. She took all my time. No, that's awesome, Chris. And what I hear him saying is, there's some of us in this room that we have counted on the stories of the past or ridden off of that. And God wants to give you a story, a story, a miracle story in your life.